Okay, hello, hello, and welcome to another live. And um, a day later than normal. <laughs> uh, yesterday was uh, Orthodox Easter uh, here in the Balkans, and so um, it wasn't a very easy day to have a live. So instead, I am here to talk to you today instead to, um, on Monday. But next week we'll be back to normal on Sunday. Um, unless you all find this a lot better <laughs> to be on a, if you find Monday a better day, then it's good to see you all. And I'm happy to um, sort of see if we can find other times as well, potentially. But um, yeah, my plan at the moment is just for this time to uh, to come to you a day later because of the uh, Orthodox Easter. So yeah, thank you all for coming. And um, as normal, I've got a few uh, bits and bobs to sort of talk through that I've been looking at and hearing from people. And today, my topic of, um, you know, what's the point of learning multiple languages and, you know, why bother with this whole polyglot thing and learning lots of languages and not just learning one or two or, you know, focusing on one or two and, and what that means actually for how well you can speak different languages. And the reason that I started thinking about this is because uh, I had a conversation with somebody recently and and they mentioned that um, that some some sort of some some people sort of had a, an adverse reaction to the idea of oh, polyglots <laughs> oh, they're terrible people and <laughs> it kind of made me laugh a little bit because um, in in history I mean I know from my own experience as well in academia um, and when I studied at university there was definitely a a feeling of learning too many languages, what a stupid idea, young man. And it's a, not not the, the thing to do because they say that they say that you're spreading yourself too thinly and you're not able to go into the depth with all of the languages. And of course you're not. <laughs> I mean, no one's pretending you can. You, you're not going to do the same things with um, two languages as you are with 25. It's, I mean, pure mathematics will tell you that. It's uh, not some sort of weird secret. Um, but just to kind of dispel a few myths, um, being a polyglot or being multilingual or whatever term you want to decide, knowing or having knowledge of many languages was a very normal thing for many, many centuries. And um, it's only really in recent history that this has become this weird thing that people sometimes do. In fact, being monolingual is still uh, the minority. Okay, being multilingual is the majority in the world on a global scale. That's just fact. Um, people learning multiple languages, whether they're at university to, pro to progress in their education, has been for centuries the normal thing to do. So a very common thing would be, oh, you want to know about this? Well, here are the books. Oh, they're in German. Yeah, you have to learn German and then you can read them. Um, oh, you want to learn more about the other Turkic languages. Well, there's lots of materials. Some of it's in Arabic, some of it's in Persian, some of it's in whatever else language. You need to learn those languages before you learn what you actually want to learn about the per the, the, uh, uh, the Turkic languages. If you're studying um, all sorts of things, things will be in different languages. Um, there are many materials that are only in Russian, there are many materials that are only in Chinese, there are many materials that are only in French or in something else. This is just the way things are even to this day to a degree, but were even more so years ago. So there's nothing strange about going out there and learning multiple languages because you needed to do it if you wanted to investigate and to research. And so it was never seen as something that, oh, you're wasting your time learning these languages and you you should be focusing on the ones that you're focusing on. Well, in actual fact, if you're learning these other languages to develop your research and move forward in your knowledge generally of the world and the topics you're interested in, sometimes you just do need to learn more languages. And if that's what your interest is in, is in, and that's where you're you're sort of you're focused on and you've committed your life to, and you that's what you do, or, or even if you just fancy doing it, it is honestly the most normal thing to do. So I mean, this isn't going to be me sort of debating too much about 
whether or not it's it, it's okay to do it. Of course, it's okay to do it. Um, for me, it's a recent sort of academic change. Really, we're talking in, in a few decades um, that people have have been having this kind of have, have had this kind of weird idea of learning other languages is it is, is something that distracts you or takes you away from other things that you should be doing and you can't give your all now let me give you an, an analogy of kind of why i find that this is one of the most ridiculous things that i hear um about you can't speak this language or that language well because you've studied other languages too it's ridiculous um in the fact that it's like saying you can't like swimming and running because you won't be good at both or you won't become an olympic athlete in swimming if you run two or if you do a practice of the sports or if you play one instrument and you practice other instruments you can play as many instruments as you want you can play as many sports as you want you can learn as many languages as you want yes you're not going to become an olympic athlete potentially in all of those sports well probably never um but you may not even become an Olympic athlete in even one of those sports, but that doesn't actually negate the benefits of learning multiple languages or playing with other languages if you feel that that's what drives you and that what that's what you want to do. The important thing in life is to do what you want to do um, in, ter in terms of academically or just as a, a fun thing that you do on the side, learning is a positive thing. I mean, encouraging people to learn is, should be the, the baseline, I think. So if people are learning, whether they learn three months or a little bit of every language in the world and go off and do something different with them, that's a choice, okay? That's a choice. And it's not my personal choice to learn a little bit of every single language and to do it over vast numbers. I do it to a degree. I play with them now because I've already done the studies and worked and built my my career and my abilities and my experience in a number of languages already. And so I, I kind of feel free to experiment and play with languages. But even if somebody didn't have that um, that base of a degree and, and to go and study languages and work with languages, just the fact that you're doing something positive with your life is is the important thing. And it feels a bit ridiculous when people feel a need to to criticize that that in other people and i've seen people criticize other people with that i've fortunately never really felt much of that criticism myself personally um but i do feel it's a bit sad when when, when we do uh, feel the need to do that because um it, it, it's sort of more of a let's have a look inside and see why we're commenting because really it doesn't make any difference what other people do. What matters is what you do, and is what you do positive, and does it have a positive effect on on your life? And 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 by extension, when things do have a positive effect on your life, in terms of you feel happy, you feel fulfilled, you feel that you're doing something worthwhile. It actually spills over onto other people, and other people feel energized by it too. Um, very often, some people do feel frustrated that's a fact and maybe maybe that is the element that we see when people criticize the idea of learning multiple languages that there's a frustration there there's a a feeling of i haven't done it so therefore no one else should do it i don't know the motivation um a hundred percent i'm not going to pretend to but um it does feel quite strange uh, when i hear those kinds of People just do different things. <laughs> Let's live and let live and, and accept that people do different things. I mean, I could look at somebody and say, oh, wow, they studied all these languages I want to study. And I could feel bad and I could then say, oh, I bet they don't speak them very well. Well, they may not speak them very well, but they, the fact is they're making a positive step to learn something new in a new language of a new culture, speaking to new people and learning something different. And that for me is the positive thing. And that for me is the most important thing. So anyone who wants to do that, whether they want to do that to an A1 level, an A2 level, and a B1, B2, C1, C2, or even to kind of a near, um, you know, native level, uh, the N level they call it in on the on the same scale. It's it goes from C2 to N. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of that because I always see people write C2 for their for their first and that if they were born monolingual and they're the first language they put as a C2, it's actually an N. Uh, end for November and 
I, I, I honestly think that if you're doing something positive, that is what counts. Um, can And then let's get back to the sort of, can you actually speak all of these languages at the same level? No. <laughs> no is a short answer. And why not? Because there's a lot of vocabulary to learn. So if you're learning lots of different languages and you're saying, okay, I want to learn, say, French, German, um, Arabic, uh, Chinese, whatever else. Let's say, let's say you take those four, right? To learn all of the vocabulary that you need to know to, to really manipulate those languages on a day-to-day -day basis in any situation, there's a lot of words that you need to learn, uh, an awful lot of words. And that may or may never happen for uh, somebody studying them. It doesn't necessarily matter though, because let's say, for example, you're, you're never gonna live in, in China, but you learned Chinese because you were interested in it. And the things that you're reading tend to be more sort of on a certain topic, or they tend to be about a certain, uh, talking to certain people about certain things. And, and so if you're not living there, do you really need to know all of the words for all of the things on your shopping list? Possibly not. Do you really need to know all of the sort of the, the very technical things about daily life in China? Mm, to a degree, yes, but possibly not everything. And that's because you're not there. And so your needs are different for each language. The same thing happens with our own first languages when we learn them. We will use them for different reasons. And so it's the same for other languages we learn. We don't necessarily need to use them at the same level. Now, this is where the game changes for me. When you, when you talk about learning multiple languages, it does very much depend on which multiple languages, right? So if you learn French, Spanish, Italian, Catalan, Portuguese, five Romance languages, okay? If you learn those languages, you would be amazed at just how much more vocabulary you get across the board of the languages to understand the literature better, to understand other contexts, other things, because the languages are related. They've drawn on slightly different types of vocabulary it can be confusing to learn them all because you can get them mixed up. But in terms of growing your vocabulary, it's a really big help. In fact, as an as an English speaker, um, it was a huge help for me to learn French and Spanish and these other Latin languages because I got a better understanding of the more high uh, level vocabulary in English because of those languages. So if you're learning languages like that, and I would definitely say it's a worthwhile endeavor to learn languages related to the languages you speak, because it gives you additional insight and input into that knowledge. And it also gives you a different context and viewpoint from history, how those peoples interacted, how they talk about each other, what kind of um, things that they see as um, that's ours, that's theirs. And you, you, you will notice often um, it's very difficult to actually pinpoint some of these things and, and give a, 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 you know, a one authentic truth. There's often a number of stories that come out of this. And yesterday I posted a, a thing about when you learn languages, when you learn more languages, particularly when you learn indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages, you will see that their stories come out in the conversations you have with the peoples who, whose languages you're learning. And those things don't tend to be represented in the same way. Um, as the sort of the main documented history. You don't always come across these documents unless you're some sort of historian and you research things uh, really thoroughly. <clears throat> Actually, it does make me think, if you think about historians um, or people who study certain texts or certain areas of culture or anthropology or whatever else, again, linguistic knowledge is good to be able to go back to documents and the same way as for somebody researching languages or linguistics or whatever else it's good to have lots of different uh, pockets of knowledge of languages just so that you can access materials and also access peoples and speak to them um, this is for me the most sensible thing um, this is why i do it i love speaking to lots of people i love the dimensions it gives me learning and i i would never honestly have um I never understand why people don't get or poo-poo the idea of, of learning multiple languages. Um, it doesn't matter to me how well somebody speaks them. Look, when, when it comes down to it, um, any knowledge you have, you know what you know um, if you're very honest with yourself. Um, and, and so 
you feel the benefits of that knowledge um, in an authentic way normally if you really do know it okay and if you if you don't know and it's just you're, you're i mean why somebody would 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 pretend to know i mean especially a language um pretending to know a language for me is a, is a, makes no sense whatsoever and i think sometimes people worry about that about um, they talk about fake polyglots and fake whatever and their language levels not well honestly if somebody is a fake polyglot um they're not going to be a fake polyglot for very long because it's only going to take some conversations with people to show they don't speak languages. I mean, it's it's not it's not something you can really fake. I mean, you either speak a language or you don't speak a language. There's no there's no kind of in between with this. It's you can speak it you can speak it to different degrees, but um, yeah, I mean, if someone's interested in doing it, even if they even even if they learn a language to to a degree that's not so high, that's not that's not the end of the world. For me personally, with my languages. So I mean, I've studied a number of them at universities around around Europe, uh, mostly, and the the languages I've studied, um, some of them I've studied I've taken to you know a high level, some of them I've taken to um, different levels, um, and some of them now when I when I study languages, I just do as a project because I'm interested in learning more about them, the people who speak the language, their history, their culture, uh, what's important to them getting to understand um you know fellow individuals around the world uh, in their own communities and that's for me the important thing and and so it's become more than just language for me it's become um actually that connection understanding a different point of view and sometimes even within english it can be a different point of view the way i see the world as someone from the united kingdom speaking english and the way some of um our friends across the pond, as we say, in the United States and Canada, um, as English speakers, how they would see um, things is very, very different. Um, and sometimes I have to, when I see things written on online or whatever, I have to almost try and flick a switch in my head. And sometimes it's hard to do that, of seeing from the context of where they're from. Um, because we have different social things going on in different parts of the world, as well as, um, you know, the situation in Europe, the situation in the United Kingdom, and the situation in the United States and Canada is very, very different. Uh, and not to mention, um, obviously, Australia, New Zealand, and then any other countries that speak other languages, you add more and more um, layers there to the history and what's going on. So, yeah, I got a lot of questions actually about. Um, these this topic of learning multiple languages and I think a lot of them come more to do with um, you know, why why you like them and and I, I saw you know a lot of you mentioned things to me like um, you know you like meeting new people too and learning new languages and, it, and that it's fun and it makes you feel freer um, and I like that you you see these benefits and that you say it's a great life skill to have it is it is a good life skill to have because um, you you can use them not just for your personal enjoyment but also sometimes for work, um, sometimes you actually have an Im you have a real impact on people's lives when you learn languages and it, you can make a difference. Um, it sounds it sounds a little bit, um, you know, a bit much sometimes when you sort of, you take it to these degrees, but it's actually true. I mean, you can um, you can speak a language at the right time to, to make a difference in somebody's life. And um, I've had experiences like that before myself. And it's actually been really, really nice to be able to speak some of these languages. Uh, when when they don't uh, speak the other language that's commonly spoken, um, so yeah, I love that you've, some of you said it's awesome. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's really it's really cool. Um, I, I like all this. Um, you, so many many of many of you actually on on Instagram, many of you replied to this. Pariva ames gen y ames cors me agrada mo. Sí, así así es. I love it. Uh, these are all the kind of things. <laughs> Somebody says, uh, "Here we go, Ollie Richards." You can you can always count on Ollie Richards saying it makes you sexy. I don't know about that. I don't think um, for me this whole social media thing. Um, I always find it quite funny when you get these trolls that write, um, you know, about about you and your physical appearance. And I'm, I'm not on the market. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so if you <laughs> if anybody watches this and they think that that's the appropriate thing to write. Um, 
I'm not interested <laughs> in that kind of comment. So if you don't find, um, find me sexy, then it doesn't really matter. I'm here to talk about languages. And um, <laughs> but I think it's funny that you wrote that, Ali. Who knows? Maybe some people are attracted to this. I don't know. It could be a thing. Who, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we need our sort of, uh, you know, we need to set up some sort of um, uh, language like lang language uh, pairing or um, so what's it called? Um, dating app. Or something. I don't <laughs> but I, I won't be doing that. So I'll leave that to your imaginations and to, <laughs> for someone out there to have a uh, a nice business plan. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I love that you you sort of you all sort of get into this and you 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 come and you defend the idea of why you know why we do this and I think that's really really good um, that you do it. I, I wish. Um, I mean, I think that in in academia there are more and more people uh, who who are actually serious about languages and multiple languages that they're now breaking that mold and I think I encourage them to continue to to fight that fight uh, because I think that uh, within academia, there are still people in there that will um, poo poo the idea of even exploring other languages. Um, if people feel that, if people feel <laughs> that, that they need to make that judgment um, because they're not doing it, somebody else is doing it. If they feel threatened by it, that could be their, that could be their motivation. I don't know. Um, but I think we need to sort of fight that and just say, if you don't want to do that and you want to learn on one language and focus on one language, even if it's just not the first language you've spoken in monolingual, that's fine. That's absolutely, it can be absolutely brilliant. And I've said this once and I'll say it again. I've said it many times, in fact, and I'll say it again. One person who I learned the most from about language and was an English language student at university who was amazingly uh, well-versed in English literature his command of English was absolutely outstanding. And quite honestly, I do appreciate when people go into that level of depth in any language. And to do that, I think you very often need to dedicate a lot of your life to that. It does not exclude you from having a hobby language on the side, though. And this is, I think, where maybe the difference is. If that's your thing and you want to focus on the one thing, fantastic, go for it. If somebody else wants to do other things, that's also fine. Go with what you feel is good for you and works for you is what I think. Um, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a thing that comes up again and again and again and uh, polyglots are this and polyglots are that and we do this and we do that and there's no point doing this, and there's no point doing that. Look, it's not like you're going out doing something bad, learning a language. <laughs> it's a positive thing to do. Um, it can only help. It can only expand your your horizons and your knowledge and your awareness. Um, sometimes when people don't want to do it or they really are very sort of vocal against uh, learning, um, I think that can be problematic um, in and of itself. Uh, regardless of their reasons, I think it's a problematic standpoint. Um, because it, it it sets up a false dichotomy. Um, and what I mean is just because you do A does not mean you can't do B. Just because you study French um, 17th century literature and that's what you've done your PhD in and you've carried on doing that uh, and you, you now lecture in French and you go around lecturing in French and you're amazing at that, fantastic. Learning some Spanish on the side or some Japanese on the side um, does not negate your excellent knowledge of 17th century French literature. It really doesn't. And if you think it does, or if you think it does for other people, then I think maybe you need to revisit your motivation for having that opinion. Um, it's it's often, I think, sadly, ignorance that, 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 that drives that. Um, that kind of mentality. And as I say, when it comes down to it, the important thing is you're happy with what you're doing. You feel the benefit of what you're doing um, and you enjoy it. And the fact that you're doing something beneficial to yourself and I think to the wider community is great. So carry on learning multiple languages and as many as you want. Um, obviously take steps to, to make sure you plan your studies and, and do it in a way. But even if you want to learn basic phrases in lots of languages, go for it. Why not? I mean, 
look, it, it can't be bad, right? It'll come up, come up for it as a good thing in a pub quiz or something at some point. Even if it's that, you can go to a you know a general knowledge quiz and and sort of do, and you'll know the answers to some questions that other people won't. Um, even these people with their PhDs and um, degrees and whatever else, you you might know something that they don't because you've looked at lots of different cultures and languages. Anyway, I, that was kind of all I wanted to say on this topic for now. Um, and I appreciate, you know, I've, I've said quite a lot. And um, and we'll now come back and have a look at your questions. So thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, I love this. Uh, okay. Uh, could you please, okay, here we go. So could you please name the languages you speak at a pretty high level? That means very little to me, unfortunately, Tamor. Um, I, 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 what, what do you mean by a pretty high level? I mean, I, I kind of, I, I use five languages at home on a daily basis, um, and they are uh, Macedonian, French, German, Spanish, and English. Um, I worked through the medium of Dutch for two years in the Netherlands, and um, and I have a degree also in Italian um, and what else? And Portuguese. I studied at university. Um, I studied Swedish um, as well. But it, it depends what you mean by high levels. I mean languages I studied formally, languages I, I speak and feel confident in. Worked in around uh, up to fourteen languages uh, for work purposes and um, that means that i can deal with the questions and, and things in those languages um so languages like bulgarian languages like serbian uh croatian um that they're, they're not a problem for me um i've used i've used my check um at events uh before my check at the moment is probably a bit rustier but um but yeah i mean i've learned I, i've used quite a lot of languages in a lot of different contexts and and so it's, it's it's a bit difficult to name them all and which levels, but um, and it, and it changes right from time to time. Uh, so, uh, but the ones that I've mentioned now are, are normally they they are pretty static uh, for me. Um, so yeah, uh, it's 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 an interesting thing with language levels. I don't actually really pay much attention to them, um, simply because I think life's too short and there are too many languages out there to learn. So. If I, if I get bad at one or worse at one and then better at another, it kind of all balances out in the end. Um, okay. Yep, YouTube questions. Alex, I've literally just got to the questions. So um, I, I've, I've been talking at the moment about my, um, just generally. Um, oh, thank you for all of your nice questions and your nice comments, Alex. Um, Yeah, raising children multilingually is fun and um, and absolutely uh, a nice thing to do. I've done that myself. My daughter speaks five languages, so yes. Um, let me see. People who don't naturally love languages tend to fear those who do. Uh, the real, uh, yeah, it, it's true that sometimes the fear of the unknown is a problem. Um, I always think that it's it's kind of I. I I don't know whether it's as over the years I've just got to a point where people are different and they have different things that they like and do and they're interested in and just let them get on with what they want to do. I mean, as long as they're not hurting you or harming you, you know, my my right to do what I want to do stops where your nose your, your nose starts, right? And and so if I'm not bothering you in any way, seriously, um, similar thing, you know, what people think of me or what I think of them. Um, it's all the same type of thing, right? We have the right to our thoughts and we have the right to our actions. Um, but they all stop when somebody else's nose begins. Um, so if we are affecting other people, that's when it becomes somebody else's business, is, is my general rule of thumb when it comes to um, the world and life. Um, yeah, Alex, I think you asked me questions at the very beginning uh, when I when I went live. I do a talk about a topic first and then I move on to Q&A at the end. So usually the Q&A starts around between 15 and 30 minutes into the live and then we get to the Q&A. So um, if I'm not answering you straight away, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I'm not really reading the comments until I finished 
um, looking at the, the, the comments I got in response to what I was going to talk about before I went live and also um, the things I want to mention myself. Uh, I just think it's nice to have a focus for these um, live sessions so that we talk about something concrete and then we move on to, to Q&A. Um, people who don't naturally are okay, language learn, learning multiple languages is so fun. It is very, very fun. Um, being monolingual is a disadvantage. Uh, do you know what, Alex? I, 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 possibly. Um, there are people who live monolingually. I'm, I see this is the thing. I'm not, I'm not kind of, I'm not this kind of the world's black and white type person. Um, I very much see the world as, as shades, right? And, and I think it's, I, I personally believe that my life is enriched by learning multiple languages, personally, okay? Some people are not interested in doing it, but they have a very fulfilled and useful life. Um, even as monolinguals, um, it's not, for me, it's it, it, it's not. I, I get why people would want to only that people only learn one language and they have a perfectly fine life. And um, and like I said, my my friend at university who who spoke only English but was amazing at English. Um, it, it is just one person to show me that you know what there's a lot of worth in studying that one language very very well if that's what your passion is. And that's the key thing is what is your passion not what's the passion of everyone else around you, what's your passion? Follow your path and follow your heart, what you want to do. Because what other people want to do can be inspirational, we can learn from it, we can take lessons, we can take notes, but what we can't do is copy it and expect exactly the same results um, for, for ourselves. We need to do our own thing, right, and be true to ourselves, and that's that for me is the important thing. So I don't know if I completely agree that being multilingual is a disadvantage. I believe that there are advantages to being mono, multilingual or speaking other languages, but I don't know if I'd say that being monolingual is a disadvantage per se. I hope that makes sense, Alex, how I've worded that. Um, multilingualism, yeah, mankind's fear to uh, of setting not monolingualism yeah it, it, it's interesting with with monolingualism i mean it's it, it is it isn't the norm in the world it really isn't um and i think we often forget that sometimes people aren't even aware that they speak or they do they do use um different almost different languages they code switch right people in germany very often do this uh people in the uk also very often do this they'll code switch between a dialectal way of speaking or <clears throat> sort of a local language way of speaking, community language way of speaking, and then they'll uh, speak the standard form of language that's taught through school, the school system. And that sometimes happens almost automatically. Um, okay, uh, let me see. So I have, I often compare polyglos polyglossia with decathlon. Learning multiple disciplines is a discipline in and of itself. It is indeed, I agree, Carlos. I think that it is, it's a different thing, right? You do your own thing. Horses for courses. Um, I just subscribed to you, sir. Oh, Dr. Uh, very nice. Okay, so let me see. Okay, I just see this. Uh, have you ever thought about creating a new language? Um, no, not really. People have asked me that before and I am um, I like that people do that kind of stuff. I think it's quite nice. Conlanging is quite a fun thing, I think. Um, but no, I haven't. I've just got so much to do with the languages that are already here. And um, the time that I have to dedicate to work and other things, I just don't have the time, unfortunately, to dedicate to conlanging. Although I do like the idea, and who knows in the future, maybe uh, when I sort of a retirement hobby that I might have, who knows. Um, but for now, no, I, there, there are actually a lot of um, a lot of languages that I want to still study. Uh, so I'll probably stick with that first. Um, Yeah, you can learn it. Yeah, Esperanto. Conlanging itself, Alex, is can be quite fun. Um, Esperanto is already there, and and it's good. And there are lots of conlang conlangs out there to learn. Um, creating your own though is is actually kind of a different thing. It, the goal's not the same. You, you're using your knowledge and awareness and creating something yourself. And there's something quite nice about doing that. So I get why people do it. And and so yeah, I understand. Um, Yes, I love that you're um, you're all also saying nice things about this. I think it's good that you um, agree with what I've been saying generally. Um, 
it's nice to see if I read the grammar of Swahili, I have to answer to the question, do you, what do you really need to do that for? Um, when you are ever, when are you ever going to use it? If I would read Tom Clancy's novel, I would have to defend it. Uh, yeah. Um, so Inga, I, I, I know what you mean. And I think that sometimes we do this, right? Because we, we listen to other voices outside uh, when we're just interested in learning about another language and we think, this has got nothing to do with what I'm doing. It's got nothing to do with my work. It's got nothing to do with my other studies, but it's there and you fancy doing it. Sometimes there's no harm in doing it. If you know that you've got the time and it's a spare time thing and that it's not going to eat into your other time, why not do it? I mean, why not read through that Swahili grammar to have an idea of how it works? But that's, I, I definitely would if it were me. Um, I've not had that for a while, actually, the Swahili grammar thing. <laughs> Who knows? It might come back. Um, yeah, people who, who don't enjoy learning languages will definitely struggle. But you're right um, about that. If you, if, if you don't enjoy doing some anything, actually, not just languages, if you don't enjoy doing something, you will never understand fully why people are so motivated to do something. Um, that's true for many things. Um, for for some sports, for um, who knows, like it could be cooking, gardening, anything. For some people, cooking is literally um i make something to eat that has nutritional value i eat it i can now live longer to carry on and do whatever else i like to do uh, for some people gardening is is utter boredom and they do it because they just want to cut the lawn and, and then go home and don't do anything um some people love love football um or uh, american football or rugby or um, cricket or any other sport and they follow it they know all the players they know all of the um you know all the matches and what happened when and and and, and that for me i in fact i i don't i don't fully appreciate it because i don't have the same passion for those uh, things but i love it when other people do i really really like when other people love things that i don't um because i love I, the most interesting and um for me, the most appealing thing in any any individual is passion, and I I just love seeing people who are passionate about about their topic, whether it's history, whether it's science. I love I love it when people speak passionately about anything um, that they that they love studying. And for me, that is probably the most. Um, that's why I also say with languages. Um, Doing what you do and love is, and being true to yourself is the best thing because your passion beams out from you and it infects other people with the same feeling of, wow, that's cool. I really want to do that. And this is why I think, um, yeah, you, you just have to do what you want to do because you want to do it and not because other people think you should do it or you think you should do it because other people you think might want you to do it. <laughs> do what you want to do because you want to do it. And that's, that's the coolest thing ever. Um, yeah, yeah, Inga, you are, you are right. Um, Timothy's right. You are right about, you know, people wanting uh, you to do what you want to do. You need to do what you want to do and, and be true to yourself. It's seriously brilliant. Um, okay. Let me see if I can say more. Uh, questions here on YouTube. Wow. I've got quite a lot of questions. Thank you all for being so into this topic i really really appreciate it um you uh you really are adding a lot for for me and i love seeing um seeing your comments what are the best books you have read in other languages um from the perspective of a native english speaker in terms of eye-opening okay here's my admission time right now i'm not a big literary li literature buff um i never have been and um i think Partly because I am, my natural interests are in in reading about science and um, reading about um, different religions and philosophy. Um, I, I I enjoy debates about those kinds of topics. I am not really a big a big literature person generally, um, so I don't know if I would be able to name books and and give and do justice to that question. I think it's a very good question, and I think that there are people who I would to in the language learning community who would give you a great answer to that question and those people would be professor alexandra aguelas and judith meyer judith meyer is also really really good she always reads lots of novels in the languages um 
Steve Kaufman might actually have some some interesting points to make on that because I know he likes to read things about um, different parts of the world uh, through the literature. For me, it's I don't know how much of uh, in terms of novels and things like that he reads. I'm not sure, um, but definitely Alexander Arguelles is is he gives amazing answers on this kind of thing, and I love his passion for this subject. And Judith Meyer, I love her passion for the subject too. So I'd reach out to them if you if you can. I know with Alexander Arguelles, it's a little bit tougher um, to to reach him um, on at the moment. I because he's, he's not making regular videos right lately, but um, he may come back to any questions you have. Uh, Judith Meyer is, he, she she writes on Reddit. Um, she writes on uh, many different places on Twitter. You can reach her easily. Um, so I would definitely uh, recommend right, ask, answer, asking that question of them. Or in fact, I may even uh, get one of them or both of them and ask them questions like this for you. And so you can get a nice answer. Because um, I think I would find it quite interesting to have a conversation about something I know my, where my knowledge isn't as, as high um, um, and my answer is not going to be anywhere near as interesting. Um, okay, people uh, keep trying to figure out the best way for themselves to learn as there's a shortcut and they won't, uh, it won't take up a lot of time. There's no shortcut, just spend a lot of time practicing and speaking. Exactly, that's that's very true. Uh, there's, there, there isn't, <laughs> sadly, there is no magic pill that we can take with these languages. It's just the way it is. Um, I love it. Um, did you learn about learning techniques and methods? Yes, I did. So I have learned different um, things about uh, uh, techniques and methods of language learning, uh, simply because I've been through the process so many times. But also at university and on courses, I've um, we looked at you know how we how we learn languages and and we have certain topics and. Things. So yes, um, I think probably my Swedish uh, studies were possibly some of the most intense in that regard, just because uh, we had an entire year focusing on pronunciation. <laughs> um, it was lots of recordings every week, regularly recording how we pronounce certain vowels and consonants and um, how to pronounce phrases and words in Swedish when they run together and different things. Um, and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It, it took, taught us a lot of techniques of the, how to recognize uh, things. Uh, we had to study things like the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, I, so, and, they, and that can be quite useful if you're trying to pinpoint the sound of a word to know that. So if you're into sounds and you want to pronounce things uh, as close as, as sort of the original as possible, um, I would recommend learning the uh, IPA as a, as a at least so that you can um, so you can see how it's represented, and you often see this in dictionaries where they they write the IPA form. So uh, that can be quite useful. Um, but yeah, I've done a lot of things with different techniques, and there are different ways of learning. I mean, the one thing I will say about learning languages is that sometimes the right way for you might not be the right way for the next person. And when I when I think of um, I always say, I always name Luca here, Luca Lampariello. So the way Luca learns languages would drives me crazy. Um, I, I love that he does it. I love how passionate he is and I love how successful he is. But what he does is not necessarily what I do. Elements are what I do, but his actual routine is not what I do. And, um, and so Luca and I are quite different in that respect. And it just shows from my, all it shows to me is you can be a successful language learner and have a very different way of learning languages. That's what that's what Luca is for me. Luca is a is a great example of somebody who's been very successful in learning a number of languages very well and not doing it the way I do it necessarily. Um, there are elements of what he does that 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 obviously do overlap, but um, but generally, I mean, he loves this whole translating everything backwards and forwards and, and annotating notes and all this kind of, I mean, it would drive me absolutely bananas doing that. But um, that's me. <laughs> I would I would get fed up of it and I'd throw away, <laughs> throw away all my books and my pencils and pens and everything and I'd just, <laughs> I'd just give up. But um, it works, right? And, and other people do it as well. And people 
follow Luca's example and it, and it works for them and I think that's fantastic. And I love that I love that the world is that diverse. I love that we all think differently. Neurodiversity is a beautiful thing. Um I, I, I this is what this is kind of and this is I think what it comes down to actually is an appreciation for neurodiversity in the world. And if you don't understand that neurodiversity is a beautiful thing, and it is a beautiful thing. Uh, because it's created many, many wonderful things in our world. Um, that's where the problem is, <laughs> I think, because it's it's kind of, you need to embrace these differences. And, and these differences are make, what makes the world so interesting and exciting to explore. Um, I love that you're, um, yeah, thank you for all of your lovely comments, by the way. How's my Persian going? Not so well, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. My Persian's kind of on, on hold. Um, my my Maori's been on hold longer than I, I'd hoped as well. Uh, but hopefully, soon, we'll get back to it. Um, Heritage, let's see. Uh, what do you suggest for Brazilian, uh, Brazilian who wants to master the Serbian language? Wow. Wow. Um, I would say um, a good place to start would be to get some books generally just on, on, on Serbian. Um, so, you know, you can look at the, the Teach Yourself Serbian book, which is pretty good. Um, I've I've read through the Serbian and Croatian books. Um, I've not read through the Serbian one in a while, but I did read through the, the Croatian one years and years and years ago. And I thought it was it was actually a really good introduction to, to Croatian. Um, and, and you could, yeah, I mean, it, to be honest, if, if you wanted, depending on how you feel with Cyrillic, um, you can try it with the, the Serbian. You can also go from Croatian and then as a base and then switch it over to Serbian. Um, that would work. It would just require a bit of a bit of effort to, uh, you know, change some things. But I think as a beginner, if you begin, it's, it's kind of like Hindi and Urdu, I think. People say this to me with Hindi and Urdu that, Sometimes, you know, if you speak one and you're learning one, people will com compliment you on the other one um, that you speak. Oh, you're learning, Hindi. you're learning Hindi and they'll say, oh, your Urdu is really good. Or you're learning Urdu and they'll say your Hindi is really good. Um, I think you can then, when you get to kind of, you, you've got to grips with the basic grammar and the elements of the language, you can then just swap it over and then and then do focus on the one that you want to really speak well. Because, I mean, the case system is the case system. Um, sometimes it's easier to memorize the words, the basic words of the language when you see them in your own alphabet. Um, I don't know. For me personally, I find uh, sometimes the alphabet can be a bit of a barrier with um, with memorizing vocabulary because you can't you can't imagine the, the the letters in your head as automatically as you can your own letters or the letters that you're used to seeing. For me, it took me it took me years for even the Cyrillic script, it took me years for it to become automatic and natural, like to the point that I see it, I see something and I just read it. It took many, many years for me. Some people say that they do this really quickly. I don't know how they do it. Um, other people do, but I don't know how they do it. If they've got some some cheat that I don't know, probably just not. It's just neurodiversity, right? It's people are different. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I I've, it took me a good few years to get to, to grips with that. And, and, and because of that, you don't necessarily see the words. Whereas now, like if I think of a word in Macedonian, I see the Cyrillic word in my head. I don't see Latin. Um, I can actually visualize words in Cyrillic. Um, whereas before, no, I didn't. I, 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 I actually just visualize the sounds. Or I think it sounds weird saying visualize the sounds. Maybe it's not visualizing the sounds. What do you do with sounds? How do you visualize a sound? I don't know. It, you kind of, you think of you think it's sad maybe you don't does anybody know that what do you say you can't visualize a sound can you or can you visualize sound or you visualize it as music or sort of something like that i don't know but um but now yeah, i can visualize sort of the letters um with greek for example i can read greek pretty well i mean as in like if i see written greek i, read, I can read it fairly well and i don't find it a problem so much but um some of the longer words I, I trip over when I'm re trying to read quickly because um, they're so long in Greek. Some of those words, but um, and I'm get I, I'm, I'm at a point where I do visualize a little bit of Greek, uh, but still it's it's not as natural as say 
Latin and, and Cyrillic. But you could do that anyway. Go <laughs> go to uh, to the teach yourself. Have a look at that. You can you can get the um, the Kindle version for like three pounds. It's three. It's not it's not expensive um, compared to other other, other courses, and it's uh, pretty good. Um, have you ever started a language after a while? Um, thought this language is not for me and start. <laughs> yeah. Um, not that it's not for me. Um, I think, uh, so Georgian is the one that comes to mind always when I think of this kind of thing. Um, I studied, I was just, I loved the way Georgian was written. I loved the script. thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen on a page. Um, visually, I just found it really appealing. And I signed up for a university course in Sweden to learn Georgian. And I mean, I, I enjoyed learning Georgian. I really enjoyed learning Georgian. Um, but it was, it got to a point where the grammar is, is quite involved in Georgian and you need to really practice it and use it to really, for it to gel. And it was at a point where um, italki wasn't a, a thing, so I couldn't find an italki teacher. Um, I couldn't find um, a teacher locally. I'd never even met a Georgian, let alone, um, you know, had an opportunity to speak it or hear it. Never. The only time I ever saw Georgian was when I was um, in countries where they imported Georgian water and they had uh, the Georgian water labels. And that was it. That was literally it. Um, so anyway, I did I did like two semesters at University of, of Georgian. So I got into the grammar and I got into the vocabulary a little bit. But um, what I was finding is it just wasn't sticking. And it wasn't sticking, not because the, the, the alphabet's actually quite easy to learn in terms of it, it, it's not that's the easiest part of Georgian really is the alphabet but the sounds that you need to make back to back the it makes the Slavic languages look like they've got a million vowels and um, and I found actually memorizing the words and retaining the words a tough thing and that was my biggest problem with Georgian um, but I do hope to go back to it at some stage I don't know if I'd say it's not for me it's just it wasn't for me at that time with the other things I had to do and I didn't have time to dedicate and to give it the love and attention that I needed to. Um, and I felt that I'd, I'd done the base of what I wanted to do in exploring the language. And that was kind of, that goal had been met. And I didn't know if I needed to extend that goal further, if that makes sense. Um, but now I've never really said a language isn't for me. Um, I, I did always say that I wouldn't learn certain languages because they were too similar to languages I already spoke. Um, and I have I have slightly gone back on that a little bit. Um, so languages like Ukrainian, Slovak, uh, Belarusian, I always said I wouldn't learn those. Um, I actually said I wouldn't learn Bulgarian at one point because I thought that it would be difficult to learn lots and lots of Slavic languages. But um, I did learn Bulgarian and that's been fine. Um, I did find with Slovak, it turned back into Czech. I did find that with, I, I, I ended up going through the link stories in Belarusian and Ukrainian uh, last summer. I just wanted to go and go through, I went through 24 of the basic 60 languages, the stories on link, and I, um, I included Belarusian and Russian. So I wanted to hear how different they were. And um, I just treated it as that, as going through the stories. And I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I still think that maybe it would be a challenge to learn them and retain them, um, though I do see the benefit of looking at them. Um, so I've kind of gone back on that a little bit, if that makes sense. But that wasn't me rejecting them. That was me more saying, OK, this is going to be too. I'm never going to speak them uh, well uh, because uh, and, and I've decided now I don't really need to. Um, just learning about them is, is fun. Um, Okay, let me see. Uh, it's so small, the, the characters sometimes. Um, is that? I can't. Do you know what? On, I'm so sorry, but on, um, you've written something. It's so kind of you to write something in Korean. Um, I can read it, but when on, on Instagram, the letters get so small. I can't make them bigger to be able to read um, all of the component parts of the um, of the block. So unfortunately, I can't read it. 
Um, the last one I can't read because of that. Um, and my, no, unfortunately I can't read it, I'm sorry. Um, something about my Korean. And you'll have to say, so, Menul Hangugo Wongu Heyo, Hajiman, Hangugo, Chal, Hangugo, Golun Chal, Mal, An Mal Heyo, um, Kure, Kure so, um, Clubhouse so, um, Chonen. Um, John and Ching, uh, oh, okay, John and um, Chigu, uh, Chigu, 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 um, uh, Manas, uh, uh, <laughs> Mana, Manayo, um, um, uh, I think. It's quite difficult to come out with Korean, uh, but it's 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 getting there. It's improving. My Korean is actually moving forwards, which is nice, and I'm feeling it moving forwards. The one that I felt moving forwards a lot lately is uh, is Cornish. My Cornish has sort of gone from um, just this baseline of studying basic vocabulary to actually I can now communicate ideas in Cornish um, without thinking too much. Korean, I'm still having to think a lot to say basic things. Um, and I don't rehearse. This is the one thing I don't need. I don't rehearse languages over and over to say basic stuff. I I tend to like that to come as a natural side effect of actually studying it. Um, but um, I'm actually really enjoying the Korean. Um, I enjoy the groups that I'm in. So thank you for writing. Um, um, let me see. What's the easiest language for you to study? Um, Esperanto is the easiest language to study because it's it was developed to be easy to learn and um, I found it super, super easy. Um, although my Esperanto is not amazing, I can communicate in it. Um, I, it's definitely easiest. Um, in terms of, as an English speaker, I would say that probably if you're taking grammar and vocabulary, Probably Afrikaans would probably be fairly easy. Scots, Scots, and then Scots would probably be the easiest to learn for an, an English speaker. Um, and then Afrikaans, possibly, maybe, because they don't have cases and they don't really have genders, so that makes it a lot easier. Then then you move to kinds of languages like Dutch, which has genders. And um, and then you have some, obviously, thing languages like German and stuff um, have cases, but then you also have the Scandinavian languages are not too bad. As an English speaker, and then because if you if you know a lot of if you read a lot of literature, particularly, you'll find French quite easy and accessible because um, a lot of our words are from from French. Uh, but writing French for even French people in France is a nightmare. Um, one of the things I used to do uh, and still do uh, with with work is uh, I look at um, assessments written by um, <laughs> native speakers. Uh, in, and how they write for French themselves. And there are lots of people who make a lot of mistakes uh, in, in their own language in French. Uh, so French is by f is not an easy language to write uh, correctly and well at a high level. Um, it definitely does. And we can, I can see why somebody would devote a lifetime to just <laughs> concentrating on French and writing it beautifully. I mean, it's the same for a lot of languages, but French is a particular nightmare for that because of all the silent letters. Um, I'm I'm answering, so I see this, yeah, answering on YouTube. I'm answering on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, so I go through all of them. Um, hopefully, I get to you all. So if I don't get to you straight away, I will definitely come back to you. Um, Latvian is so underrated. I absolutely agree. Latvian's beautiful. I love Latvian. Um, do I speak? Do you journal? Um, actually, do you know I don't journal? I don't write a journal about, about my language studies. Um, it's one of the things that um, I always think I should do, but then I think no other people think I should do. So do I really want to? Probably not. So I don't, um, if that makes sense. Um, he perdido motivación por aprender idiomas. Uh, 
que me recomiendas para volver? En hablar con gente y empezar a, a hablar con la gente, porque hablando siempre con, con otras personas que están aprendiendo el idioma, eh, pasó igual conmigo con el coreano. Es que no pasó un mes sin estudiar el idioma, ¿no? Uh, uh, y no, que, no, no tenía mucha motivación para continuar con mis estudios, la verdad. Y lo que hice es que en Clubhouse encontré un grupo de personas estudiando coreana también y estudio con ellos hasta ahora siempre. Entonces, uh, eso sí que me ayuda mucho. Uh, y recomiendo hacer eso, uh, hablar con más personas estudiando los idiomas y hacer cinco minutos, decirte a ti, pues yo voy a estudiar cinco minutos, no más, cinco minutos, diez minutos, ya. A ver qué tal te va y vas a ver que vas a continuar. ¿Vale? Pues nada, nos vemos, chiques, <ríe> como se dice. Uh, pues nos, nos vemos. Uh, see you all soon. I have to uh, finish now because we're at the hour and um, I have a few other things that I need to move on with and also Instagram hates it when you go over the hour. So speak soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions. And I will see you all next week. Hopefully on Sunday. See you then. Bye-bye.